This episode is powered by Safety FM. The Crucial Talks Podcast with your host, Mike Saddam. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Mike Saddam. Welcome back to the Crucial Talks Podcast. For those of you that are giving this a try or those who have been listening for a while, if you get a chance, if you like what you hear, I'd really appreciate it if you could rate the podcast and subscribe to it. It really helps us grow the audience we want to grow to really help people understand what drives them and what drives other people. And if you have any questions for me, you can always feel free to reach out to me by visiting www.crucialtalks.com or connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Now, one of the goals of the Crucial Talks podcast is to improve the lives of others. And we do this by focusing on strengths and positives. That's why I'm really interested in workplace experience, because so many people complain about their workplaces, their bosses, their coworkers. And we also see a lot of conflict in other places, like in traffic, in our stores, in our political process, even in things like sporting events. Now, knowing that people are social storytellers, that we crave social belonging and social esteem, I really began to seek out people that thought these issues were something that needed to be addressed, that there was something missing in the world or missing in their communities that they wanted to do something about. So I ended up meeting Gabriella Van Ray online through LinkedIn, and we had a conversation about what she is doing to address some of these issues. Now, she's the founder of the Dare to Be Kind movement. She's also an author, a kindness expert, and a keynote speaker who delivers talks to provide the groundwork for lasting change. In other words, she's helping people be more kind. Now, she draws from science. She draws from her cross-cultural experiences, and she uses a, a little bit of wit to inspire people and organizations to access the power of kindness. Now, what I love about what she's doing is that she is focused on building a positive capacity in people and that capacity is kindness. Now, Gabriella has been on Dr. Phil, ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox. And today, she's on the Crucial Talks podcast. Hi, Gabriella. How are you today? I am great, Mike. I'm so glad to be on your show. And I love your positive attitude. Well, thanks. And the things you're doing out there are, are really super important to this, really to this world and to being more kind to people. Now, I always find people's origin stories really interesting because it gives, <laughs> us, well, it gives us all this little peek into how people get to where they are and how they have developed the drive to do what they do. Now, your drive is this push for people to be more kind. How did you get here? What, what was your journey that sparked this passion to bring more kindness into the world? Yeah, the funny part is, you know, if you had asked me at 10 and at 20 and at 30 kindness, I would have said, yeah, it's part of who we are, all of us, right? I wouldn't have, I, I would have thought it was normal and that's about it. But you know what? Um, when I wrote my first book, in 2010, which is a memoir about my origins. <laughs> and um, I realized that I took my pain, which is one of my favorite quotes, I took my pain, turned it into my greatest strength, which makes me the cause's best ally. And I think, Mike, all of us can do that. And to tell you the truth, I think there are many, many people that do do that. And so my origin is my biological mother, as the story goes, uh, dropped me in a Catholic orphanage in Pakistan, a Muslim baby. And the reason I kind of say that on purpose so that people understand how dangerous this could have been for her. And she did that. And there in that orphanage, I got the name Gabriela. So I've basically had that name all my life. Spent three years in the orphanage with nuns that came from Europe. And then I got lucky and I got adopted by this Dutch couple. Hence the weird Van Rey name. <laughs> and, but, you know, that should be the happy ending right there, right? It, it should be the beginning of a new life, the beginning of receiving a family, all these gifts 
but it didn't turn out that way. And the reason I'm saying that is because what we forget is that people are cruel and people are judgmental. And so when I arrived, I never knew there was anything wrong with me, Mike, until I met people in the Western world and that they started saying stuff like, you're brown, you're short, you've got a straight, you've got a weird eye, you look weird, you are weird. Um, and that all made me pause and think there was something wrong with me. And in the orphanage, of course, we all looked alike, so I didn't know there was anything weird with me, right? And when I say this, this was in 1966 when adoption in Pakistan was actually totally illegal. Um, and I have no idea how they got me out. Really, no idea. When I read all the paperwork my parents had, I mean, I think I ended up being really, really lucky. So at the one hand, I know, my brain knows that I'm lucky, but my heart isn't so sure sometimes. Does that make sense, Mike? It does. And even though I'm much older, not wiser, older, <laughs> and uh, being older, I still say that sometimes because I have learned to say to people, you know, I, I do have one leg in the East and I do have one leg in the, in the West. And I have learned not to belong to either, to stand on your own two feet. And that comes with a price. That comes with a price in the sense that you'll be alone, that you are different than others and that you learn to take solace in your life from within and not from everything that you have outside. So I learned very early that I actually did appreciate the few people that were kind to me and they, that stuck with me. And that really came out while I wrote the book. I didn't realize that there were so few that, that, that extended that olive branch that extended that wouldn't immediately just outcast me. And I, I'll give you an example for your listeners that they might really relate to in the workplace. You know, when I was young and I was in my 20s, I would get a job offer over the phone, right? Over the phone, I would talk to the secretary or to the gentleman that was going to hire me, and they would only hear my voice. And yes, I have an accent. That is true but it is not necessarily a heavy accent. So people just kind of thought I was kind of an integrated immigrant and they wouldn't necessarily think of me with the color skin that I do have, right, brown. And so when I then got in, invited to come for a real interview, then when I came and they saw me, they would go, no, 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 no. Um, there is no job opening. And I would go, don't you recognize my voice? I recognize yours. And then they would go, Gabriela. And I would go, yes, yeah, something wrong. And so that was a, a, a gentle form of rejection, I think. I took it as pretty gentle. I wasn't very angry at it. But as the years go by, I did realize that when they didn't see me, they were all hunky-dory about it because I fit in in the corporate climate. But then when they saw me, I guess my looks didn't fit in because the companies at that time weren't very diverse. Do you see what I mean? I do. And it's kind of an interesting point you brought up here because when they were just talking to you, it seemed like you fit in. But then when they saw you, it seemed as if they, they painted you with a label and put you into a group that they thought didn't belong. Is that what you saw happening? Exactly. And when I started this whole kindness thing, and when I wrote my book, I lived in Vancouver, British Columbia. And so I know that a lot of Americans know that place because it's beautiful and the cruise ships leave from there to, to Alaska, right? And but what they don't know is on the surface, it's beautiful. But I have met many, many people in my interviews with people on the streets that the people that do look like me in Vancouver changed their names. So, for example, I did an interview with a gentleman and his name was Iman. And this is 2012, just so you know. This is not like years ago. This is 2012. And they were saying, if I phone up someone or if I put Iman on my uh, curriculum vitae, I will not get hired. I put Ian on there and I'll get the interview. I'll get the foot in the door. So 
to me, this was kind of like, wow. And I just went, I got to do something about these aspects that we're unwilling to talk about because we're a little bit embarrassed. Like I never talked about it either. What I just told you, nobody ever asked me because it's a little bit embarrassing, right? And we don't want to talk about things that are kind of embarrassing and that hurt us a little bit, you know, even if it's not a big, big one for me, we don't want to talk about it because it makes us feel like we're a loser, you know? Yeah, and what's really interesting about your, what you're talking about is the fact that you have taken this, what is really a, a negative. I mean, putting somebody in a box, stereotyping them, and making a decision about employment based purely on, on how they look when right before you saw how they looked, you're ready to hire them. That's a pretty big deal, and people could take that and just be negative about it. They could feel that all they could do is blame that person for that outcome or complain about it. But really what it sounds like you did was you saw from those experiences and from talking to other people that there was a greater need in the world and you, you took that situation and it seems like you put on a different lens to go a different direction. So instead of blaming people and complaining and being a victim, you turned your lens and tried to do something about it. I have a quote that I used on one of my many campaigns because I've been on campaigns for the last nine months, uh, nine months, nine years, and I always called it campaigns. And the name I came up with of one of them was blame is not the cure, action is. And that actually came into my head because every time something happens to us, we blame um, everyone. The gas station did it. Because, you know, it wasn't clear and I couldn't see the pump and that's why I hurt my car. And, you know, it's, it's, it's all day long. We blame everyone from the moment we wake till the moment we go to sleep. And if we do that, we have a very, um, I, I feel like we don't let kindness in. And we kind of close the walls off, just like we close people off, we close ourselves off. And if we do that, there is no way that we can shift it. And the only way I show people to shift it is forget who did what, you know, like let the person go in front of you. If they're that press, like, you know, just let them, they have one loaf of bread, let them go in front and say, Hey, I, I see that you're rushed. Go ahead. It's not going to hurt you. It's going to take one minute away out of your day. But think of the person that you just did that with. They lit up. They, I, I mean, they light up totally. And, and that's what it's about. I'm just trying to find small ways to show people how to put quality back into your life and to show you that you are in the driver's seat. It's either negative or it's positive. And I always tell them, you don't have to go overboard. All the kindness I talk about is not lovey-dovey. That's why our movement is called Dare to be Kind, because it's really hard. Well, and that is, this is a very interesting topic because where you've kind of led us so far, I, I've told people this before. I said, we normally speak. When we speak, we speak in like three different ways. We either speak about I, me, or we speak yep. about us and we, or we speak about they and them. And when I, yep. when I tell people, hey, if you hear a lot of they and them coming from you, they did this, look at them, they caused this, they treated me bad. If you're talking a lot of they's and them's, that's a time to stop and think, okay, if I'm saying they and them all the time, what I'm doing is saying I'm a victim, I'm just being victimized by these people, or all I can do is complain about them. But then if you start talking in eyes and we's, now you start being able to take action. And it sounds like what you're doing is you're shifting people's focus to the I and we. What can we yeah. do together? What can I do to contribute? And this, this need or this thought that it's a, something to dare to do really is, I think, a profound statement you make because your little quote was awesome. Blame is not the cure, action is. So what you're saying is, hey, if you're going to just focus on them and what they did to you and all that, 
that really gets you nowhere. That's kind of the easy way out. If you start talking about what can we do, what can I do, what can we do to change this thing that we're dealing with, it does take action and all action seems to come with a little bit of risk. Yep. It always comes with risk, but you know what? Dare to be kind is dare to be kind to you. Dare to say no. Um, you know, it took me years to say no. I think, I think it's also a little bit of a woman thing. You know, my, my mom growing up already told me that, you know, I had to, you know, be kind of servient as, as a woman. And, and I hear that other women say, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are actually taught to always help, you know, if we go to church, then we help the whole church community. We don't dare to say no. If we're at work, then you're the one that brings the cookies, you know? And if once you don't, then everyone goes, oh my God, where are the cookies, you know? But you, you, you got to dare to be kind to yourself by also saying sometimes no, no matter what they say. In my case, as you know, Mike, people call me the kindness expert. And if I say no to someone, I get back, oh man, you were a bee and, uh, you know, like a bitch or you were, um, you, you are definitely not a kindness expert. And I said, yes, I am, because I cannot do this, even though I'd love to do it for you. I cannot. It is impossible for me to do this wish for you within 48 hours. You can't do it. Now, if you think that's terrible, great. You can blame me all you want. But you know what? Don't call me names. Well, so it sounds like that you can be, I mean, being kind doesn't mean being a pushover. No, absolutely not. And this is the core. Being kind is, uh, for example, Mike, let's say that um, everyone wakes up. Well, I hope most of us wake up. So when we wake up, do you think any of us have the thought in our head that we go, oh, we're going to be mean to this person and this person and I'm going to get to my colleague today. None of us wake up with that. It's just not not true. It's just not happening. I've interviewed so many people and so have you. They don't do that. It escalates and it escalates due to them. So I always say we, and I agree with what you always say, we, we spend so much time in the workplace. What, what is the percentage, Mike? Uh, I think the latest is about 13% of employees feel engaged at work. That's in the U.S. Yeah. Okay, super. And we spend, what, 80% of our time at work? Uh, yeah, I'm guessing something like that. So you figure even yeah. if you're only working eight hours a day, uh, yeah, you spend a lot of time at work. Okay, so 80% at work. We're not very productive. We're definitely not happy and engaging. Then what is the reason? Well, the reason is because... Often you have workers that think, oh, well, I'm just there for a paycheck. But that too takes an attitude change. I always say to people, when you go to work, there are two things you need to learn. The first thing is you need to put kindness on like you do your clothes in the morning. That's number one. Number two, because kindness only grows more kindness. But if you're not kind, nobody is going to be kind to you either. So that's one. But the second one is difficult, and that's communication. We need to watch our delivery. We are unfiltered, uncensored, and the way we talk and the way we text one another or social media is just unacceptable. And so when we go to work and we talk to one another, how do we do it? Now, I'm going to give you a tip, for example, for everyone that listens in the workplace. Your silence in the workplace could be seen as mean or harassing or bullying or whatever word you want to give it. But definitely, let's put it in one word, unkind. And then tell you why. Because if you're a group at the, um, at the coffee stand in the morning, in the kitchen, wherever it is at work, and you, every time I come in, everything goes quiet, you know, by the third or the fourth time, I'm going to think it's me, right? I'm going to think I did something. Or I'm going to, even worse, I'm going to think that everyone was talking about me and gossiping. So silence at work is just as much a communicator as all the gossip and the talk, right? The negativity. So I say to people when they say, ah, oh, but it wasn't me, it wasn't me. 
I said, you're part of it. If you're silent, you're part of it. Speak up, stand up for each other, and treat each other. We're a team. It doesn't matter that you're the manager. It doesn't matter that you're the boss. It doesn't matter that you're all the way at the bottom. You're all a team. And it, you're all working for the same end result. And that is the part that we forget in today's world. Well, I think that's a really interesting topic you just hit on here because we talked about you have to dare to be kind, right? That it's not about being a pushover, that people aren't engaged at work. And now a lot of the people that listen to this podcast may be managers, they may be supervisors, they may be uh, safety personnel, that, that their job is to engage with other employees that may need to change their behavior. So they're going to have to have these difficult conversations with other employees that in a lot of cases being negative or communicating negative may be the easiest way to communicate. So if we're, if we're daring to be kind and we know that being kind doesn't mean having to be a pushover and you have to have this difficult conversation, you want to change somebody's behavior. There may be a problem you're seeing. You're trying to get to the bottom of an issue. You know, is it a personal issue? Is it a professional issue? Do you need more training, something going on at home, but you want to have this conversation with them. I know when your keynotes talks about effective communication, so when exactly. you're trying to have these difficult conversations what are some tips that we could use from you to have those difficult conversations, but still be kind? The first one, be vulnerable. And I know that that is almost the hardest. Communication, vulnerability, and kindness go hand in hand. I give you a very simple tip. Um, didn't sleep, you know, tossed and turned all night. I come to work. Of course, I'm grumpy. But we have not learned. Nobody taught us. Our parents didn't. The school didn't. Uh, university didn't. Nobody taught us to communicate this. If you said to your colleagues, hey, guys, can you have my back today? I am so absolutely exhausted. Don't ask. Don't know why. Just happens to be. Could you cover me a little bit? You all walk in the boardroom totally different. Everyone is going to have your back. If you don't say it, then you're grumpy and someone will say in the boardroom, yeah, but it's all Gabriella's fault because she didn't hand in the documents that I needed to present to you today what we needed. And then people go, all oh, will stare at Gabriella and I will think, wow, thanks a lot. You just threw me under the bus, right? But if you don't throw someone under the bus, when you actually protect them and say, hey, yeah, so sorry, sir, I will have this for you by Friday. Didn't get it done. Not going to explain to you why. Don't worry, sir. It's going to get done really soon. There is a total different attitude in that room. And when I walk out, I say to that guy or that lady, thanks. And I promise you that you have an ally at work for the next 50 years. <laughs> well, and that's really interesting because it really comes down to you're in, in that one story you just told us, that one example, that yep. example doesn't change. However, what changes is how you perceive the outcome. it. Yep. And that perception ultimately uh, ends up in this better outcome. But the better outcome can only happen if you are clear in your communication beforehand. See, the, the, the problem is we don't do that. We start blaming everyone in the room and throwing our colleagues under the bus. And don't forget, the bosses do see that, right? They do see that there's no team. So that's why I dare to say uh, the, the leaders, uh, our bosses, the managers, the, the executives in business do not realize how much kindness is their untapped advantage, but they don't use it either. So that's why I, I'm a keynote in corporations, right? Because if we break every single problem that they have down, like um, take these big, big uh, companies like FedEx, they have to talk like to every state. I'm just going to take the United States, for example. Let's say, 
uh, when Iowa is on the line with New York, New York just goes, oh, God, it's the stupid Midwestern, right? In your head, you have that little judgment going on. And they have the judgment going on, oh, that's the New Yorkers. They think they're better than us. If we can break all those barriers one by one with humor and by teaching the difference between an opinion and a judgment, then the kindness can totally, totally um, accelerate within the conversation and within a day-to-day basis. But we need to teach them, just like you teach algebra to someone. Well, and so these corporations that you speak to are the ones that that really need to change because there's a lot of them out there that really yep. need to shift their perspective and how relationships work within the organization where kindness really is, I love how you said it, really is an untapped advantage. So when we're yep. talking about kindness being an advantage, what is sort of the ROI, the return on investment for corporations, companies, teams that try to shift how they think to be more kind? What is that ROI for kindness? Oh, wow. It's, it's huge. Can you imagine their advantage when they understand the, the skills in communication? For example, like I said earlier, that their silence is basically complicity too, that it's a part of harassing someone else or making them feel less worthy. When uh, the, the team, instead of blaming each other for the presentation not to look good or not to be done, work together together. When they stay after five to actually finish it together and then go to the pub and have a beer or a pizza slice and say, wow, we did it. When they shift like that, leaders just go, oh, my God, I didn't even know this was possible. And don't forget, we live in such a diverse world at the moment. You have no idea. None of us have any idea what's going on in the in the peewee brains i always say it our brains are really small in all the little brains what is going on one might have a father that's ill another has a child that it can't afford the tuition and is trying to figure out how to get it to school another one has maybe an autistic child and there are so many personal problems that we have that is almost impossible possible to give it our 100% at work. And that's where the key lies. Because when we explain to them how to be in the workplace, believe it or not, Mike, they actually take some of this and it rubs into their personal lives. They will treat their partners differently. They will try to teach their children this little trick too. And before they know it, I I can tell you from experience, and I'm being really honest here, I had a chip on my shoulder. That chip was pretty big, you know, when someone said, hey, you there. I said, me, me, you sure, me, you know, because I I was used to be treating badly. So you get that chip slowly and surely it exists, right? And, you know, and people said, well, who are you? And I said, I'm Dutch. And they would say, no, you're not Dutch. And I would say, yes, I'm Dutch. And that doesn't help because I don't look Dutch, Mike. I definitely don't look Dutch. (laughs) I look um, Middle Eastern, maybe Spanish, maybe Indian, but definitely not Dutch. And so I had to shift that perception. It is okay that the rest of the world can't see it, you know, and just be fun with it. Now I say, I'm Dutch. I know. I don't look it. but Don't worry. I know that I'm Dutch. (laughs) <laughs> well, and it really comes back to what we were talking about before, because by shifting your perception, you basically said, okay, what do I have control over? I don't have control over what the, how they see me or what they think of me, but I do have control over how I respond to that. Yep. So mm-hmm. when we're talking about some of these things in the workplace, and I love how these techniques in the workplace can also cross over into personal lives because these, these skills, I mean, skills are all about practice. I mean, every, everything we want to become really, we have to choose what we want to become and then take actions to become that. So all of these skills we're talking about 
it seems like they are going to require practice, but as you practice them, as they become more habitual, they actually start to become part of who you are and who you want to become. Exactly. Exactly. And what what people need to really see, I think, is th- this is kind of a tough one for a lot of people. Is I, I know that a lot of people suggest to think out of the box. I don't. I, I don't suggest anyone to change who they are. Because, you know what, Mike, everyone has the right to be in their little bubble. And so that's not something I do. I, I, I leave people in their bubble. I just explain that when you want to box me in, that you live in a, bu- a bubble, that's fine. But try not to box in everyone in your bubble. Set them free because we all have our own bubbles. And so, for example, I, I taught an autistic young student the other day. He said, well, they always think there's something wrong with me. And I said, but do you understand the moment that they say autistic or Asperger or any of those, they, ha- they put you in a box so that they feel comfortable. And that was a revelation for him. I said, when someone says to me, well, you're Indian, they put me in a box so that they feel comfortable. And that I say to everyone that experiences that, let that slide. Because if that's the way that the person across from me feels comfortable with me, then it's more than okay. Well, as we kind of wrap up this episode, I know you talk to a lot of people about building a culture in the workplace and yeah. taking actions so that, because culture is very, very powerful, right? It's, it's those yeah. beliefs that exist within the, the company or within the community, but that culture is what drives behavior. It's what gives people that feeling that what they're doing is the right thing to do. So as we close out this episode, can you give us maybe one or two of those key components that we really need to have in our workplaces to have an impact on the culture to move more toward inclusiveness or kindness or better communication? What are we, what are we looking for for some of those key components? Well, the first thing I would say, please, Everyone, and you're all going to laugh, when you, when you talk with the word blah, 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 my people, please eradicate that from all your sentences. It's actually much easier to do. When you do that, it excludes the person you're talking to. And that person might be really offended. So include people by not using my people. That's already one. And then the other big one is a culture is only a learned behavior and habit so that you're comfortable. Do not forget that a lot of things that you do every day were learned behavior through your parents and the culture of your environment. They are not necessarily yours. So, I always say jokingly, especially with all the diverse people in your workplace, throw them to the wayside. You know, I mean, yeah, if you have hot dogs and hamburgers on Memorial Day and someone else has sushi, who cares? Start totally new. And if you want to bridge the gap at work with someone that you've never talked to and you're a little scared, start with food. Nobody. Nobody will refuse to try food. Look at all the restaurants we have. We have an array of restaurants here. So start with food. Bring something to work that everyone can share that's from your culture. I promise you, no one will laugh at you. It will open up the door. You just opened up the door. Now it's up to the colleagues to step into it. Well, I think that's all great points. It really comes back really comes down to this whole thing we started with that that people really need to feel belonging and social esteem with Absolutely. each other. It's been a belonging t- is the biggest sorry, belonging is the biggest universal emotion. When we can't belong, Mike, devastating things happen in our society. Suicide, school shootings, school uh, shootings, period. All the things that we see. 
we are social human beings and we need to socialize. And when we can't, we are outcasted. And that is very, very difficult. Well, and that's why I think what you're doing is so important because a message you have, it goes beyond just daring to be kind. It really is about daring to include and having people belong to groups and in and being inclusive in communities and workplaces is such a powerful thing that everything you've talked about today has been really valuable. So I know you're out there right now. You've been, you've been on this world tour for eight or nine months. You're trying to get the word out there. You've got three books out there. You're doing keynotes. If people need more information about you, if they want to get in contact with you to get more information about what you're doing or about the Dare to Be Kind movement, where can they go to contact you or to get more information? So we have two websites. For the keynotes, just type gabriella.global and you will find all my keynotes on there. And for the movement directly, if you want to become a kindness in skater, you want to help, you want to donate, then uh, or you want to ask me to your schools, uh, go to daretobekindmovement.com. We are on Facebook. We are on LinkedIn. We are everywhere. If you do hashtag daretobekind, there is... We will pop up everywhere because we try to make it simple so that you don't have to type my difficult last name. And I want to end with something really important. This is our slogan. One moment, one person, one kindness is all it takes to help any other human being go from a negative space to a positive place be the difference. Well, I think that's a great place to leave off the fact that one moment and helping one person, being kind to one person can actually shift the trajectory of somebody's life. I think that's a huge benefit and something that's that's really valuable, something we can look at as a goal we might have every day. If you just have that one moment, you could positively, positively impact somebody's life, which they'll then positively impact somebody else. And then this whole kindness movement really starts to expand. So that's a great point to leave off on. And I really wanted to thank you for coming on to the show. I want to thank you for having me because anytime we can talk about kindness in the workplace and kindness in personal lives, it will affect the people that were listening. So I thank you, Mike. Well, thank you so much. And everybody out there, thank you for listening. If you have a chance, please visit me at www.crucialtalks.com or connect with me via email, LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Whatever you need, please contact me so I can get in touch with you. Also, if you could do me just a quick favor, if you could share the podcast, leave a review for it and rate it, I would greatly appreciate it. This will help other people find these great interviews, just like the one we just had with Gabriella. Have a great week. And remember, if we want to understand behavior, we need to understand what drives people. Please review, share, and subscribe to the Crucial Talks podcast. Visit CrucialTalks.com.